Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. This year's Yom Kippur, the Hebrew Day of Atonement, came in late September, and it reminded me I'd been ordained on Yom Kippur in 2002. Each year it serves as a reminder of what I have to atone for, and this year it made me think of something I should share. For years, I confess, I've been oversimplifying Jesus' words about what the two greatest commandments are. I've shortchanged it by saying simply, love God and love one another. It's an easy oversimplification to make, since Jesus himself says the two are alike, but really not in the way I shortchange it. Love for God and loving your neighbor like yourself are both different and intertwined, and I was reminded of it once again the other night watching Steven Spielberg, uh, Spielberg's um, loosely autobiographical film, The Fablemans. In the movie, Spielberg portrays how his mother and his father's best friend fell in love with each other, and how his father, loving both of them, feels empathy, forgiveness, and mercy for them, even as they abandon his life and his love for them to be with each other. Heroic empathy has a deeper resonance than the word love in a situation like this, and it bears examination. Frankly, we have a big problem with understanding and living with the meaning of love in the full sense of the word. The Bible tells us Jesus was asked to name the greatest commandment. Jesus' answer to the greatest commandment question appears in three Gospels, and each is differently nuanced. Let me read each to you. In Matthew 22, 36, 40, it's reported, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In Luke, it's told as the parable of the Good Samaritan. It goes like this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. And who is my neighbor? So in answer to that question, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan and then asks the man the same question. Which, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man? The one who had mercy on him, the man replied. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And in Mark 12, 28 through 34, it reads, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So let's start with loving God as Mark tells the greatest command. First of all, Jesus says, the Lord is one. There is no division of affection necessary. We are to, quote, love God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind and with all our strength. With a statement like that, including heart, brain, mind, and soul, what's left for loving yourself and your neighbor as yourself unless we comprehend that we ourselves are all part of the one? Now, pop culture likes to talk about the need to love yourself before you can love others. But that may be getting things backwards. 
It's hard to love ourselves when we truly acknowledge our faults and how we fail to love others. Do we automatically forgive ourselves when we screw up simply by rationalizing that if, well, if we don't love ourselves, then we can't love anyone else? Well, we know it's not that simple. But there is a popular old song, a song by the Mills Brothers <laughs> that proclaims, you always hurt the one you love, the one you shouldn't hurt at all. You always take the sweetest rose and crush it till the petals fall. You always break the kindest heart with a hasty word you can't recall. So if I broke your heart last night, it's because I love you most of all. <laughs> the, the song is a crock full of rationalization, of course. Uh, to tell someone you hurt them, but the hurt is only proof you love them best, makes no sense in a healthy relationship. <clears throat> it might make sense in a sick one, a flipping of the do unto others rule. If we sabotage ourselves all the time, why not sabotage others as well? What more proof of lack of love for ourselves than to treat the ones we say we love really badly? But then, how can we love ourselves if we can't love others? It's a spiral downhill. Telling you to love your neighbor as yourself when you dislike yourself could easily become a curse. And doing unto others as you'd have them do unto you might even turn violent if you really despise yourself. Look at all those poor souls out there too afraid to commit suicide except by shooting others until the cops kill them. Suicide by cop, it's called. Too often involves killing innocent bystanders in order to get yourself killed. Perhaps instead of trying to love ourselves, we should start by offering ourselves the possibility of mercy where we've gone wrong in our lives, to offer to make amends where possible and to do better in the future. The best model for that, of course, is what NDEers describe as a life review, complete empathy for those we've hurt in our lives. You feel what the other person felt as a result of how you dealt with them. That's what an NDEers life review makes possible, and they'll tell you it's a powerful experience. But we don't have to die to experience it. We can do it for ourselves by imagining ourselves in the other person's shoes. Another way to put it is, wake up, work on that, and at first you'll love yourself even less for the revelation it provides. Nevertheless, you can wake up your ability to feel more empathy for others in the future. So, really, empathy, not love, is the key word for describing how to love others like ourselves. Get good at it, and you can become compassionate in your dealings. And as you get better at being kind and generous to others, you will actually come to feel love for yourself as well. The spiral goes upward as well. And that's because we are all one after all. Jesus expanded our understanding of oneness with his story of the Good Samaritan. The original Bible reference to love your neighbor as yourself is more limited. It comes from Leviticus 19.18, which reads, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So in this Old Testament admonition, the command only pertains to anyone of your people, that is, people of your same tribe, in Leviticus being the Hebrews. Jesus expands the definition enormously with his Good Samaritan story. A man is beaten and robbed on the roadside, a priest and a Levite, both of the same tribe as the victim, walk on by. But the Samaritan, someone from a different tribe, sees the stranger, cares for him, and helps him to heal. Jesus makes it clear by this story that every one of us is a neighbor to everyone else. For regular listeners to this show, you may have noticed my recent obsession with St. Francis and how he saw God's love infused throughout all things. No one saw better than Francis the oneness of all and the natural fit of loving God with loving one another. But you have to be there where Francis was uh, to, spiritually to really get it. And that takes time. It certainly did for me. 
Well, since this is a reflection of my Yom Kippur ordination, let me offer you the story of my own childhood NDE and what it did and didn't teach me about love. My father was away in the war, and my mother devoted her time to me with all her concern and love. And what I remember from that time was my mother's love, which felt wonderfully complete for my first four years of life. My heaven on earth vanished, though, when my father came home from the war. I still remember the memory of him coming through the door and the military aura that entered our lives. My mom's attention turned to him immediately and naturally to my two younger sisters as they were born. I learned the meaning of jealousy, depression, and fear. Since I was convinced, I now played no more than a small role in my mother's subdivided life. I regressed almost immediately with crying and tantrums and scary dreams. One recurring nightmare was of me on a checkerboard being pushed back, pushed back to the back row where I couldn't move and couldn't escape. My father was angry with me generally, which only made things worse. All he knew of fathering was what he'd learned from his own fiercely demanding upbringing. Now, I've always claimed that my death was merely an accident, a slip of the foot, a mistake of judgment. I mean, whoever heard of a seven-year-old who wanted to drown himself? But remembering my depression from those days, I sometimes wonder. Anyway, here's what happened. I was seven and a half, not knowing how to swim, and I waded out too far. The slope fell off sharply, and I slid down the edge into deep water. I thrashed about, came up once, but then I, I let out a full-throated scream. And the scream, of course, emptied my lungs, and so I sank slowly to the bottom, choking as my lungs sucked in water. But then the miracle happened. My soul, my consciousness left my body, left the lake, and found itself in a birch tree that stood near the door to the cottage. My mother had heard my scream, and from my perch in the tree I could see her in her red dress, running out of the cottage, down to the shore to jump in, dive down to my body, and pull me up. She dragged me to the shore, threw me face down with a log under my chest, and pushed on my back, trying to get the water out of my lungs. In the process, she more or less invented CPR, since the log did chest compressions each time she pushed. Meanwhile, I realized I was home again home the way it should be, filled with a love better than heaven on earth. I remember seeing a light I could go into, but no angel that I recall, no beings were there to tell me what to do. But what I was realizing as I watched my mother struggling, pleading with me to come back, was the proof of love I doubted ever since my dad had come home from the war. Both God and my mom loved me unconditionally. I was overwhelmed by the love from both, but my mom was so distraught, I just knew I had to stay with her and go back to my body. And so mom's efforts got my heart started again. Now, there is a dream or a series of dreams connected with my death. For years afterward, while growing up, I had this recurring dream that I was falling away from the light down a dark tunnel. When I'd wake up, I thought it was a memory of my sinking to the bottom of the lake. The light was the sun on the surface and the Darkness was water too deep for, for the light. So years later, in my 20s, I returned to the lake and dove down just to see if my dream reflected the reality of sunlight underwater. It did not. The sunlight spread uniformly across the surface of the lake and all the way to the bottom. There was no tunnel effect at all. It was not until years after that, in first reading about near-death experiences, that I realized the light I was falling from was memory of the intense love of God. My near-death experience was not elaborate, at least as far as I can remember. My dreams suggest I traveled further into the light than my perch in the birch tree would suggest, but as I say, I don't recall. What I do know is the extent to which it changed my life, primarily by removing my fear of death and my fear of not being loved, two fears that are connected to each other in remarkable ways. It pulled me out of the shell I'd been building 
and stirred my natural curiosity about life into a full-on drive to learn and experience more. Recovering in bed, I decided not to tell my mother what I had seen. I'd felt her anxiety viscerally as she pumped on my body to get my heart going. Her pain at that moment precluded any consideration on my part of going into the light. My NDE was reassuring to me, but I sensed that confirming I died would have made that would have been just devastating for her. Fact is, it was decades before I told anyone about my experience. In the meantime, though, my NDE was giving me ideas that would change my life. My mom surely noted how my behavior changed after the drowning. I'd been a very ordinary kid with school by day and our small screen black and white TV by night. It was the Howdy Doody show and Kukla Fran and Ollie, both puppet shows, with a dash of Hopalong Cassidy that mostly held my attention. But not long after my drowning, I, I found myself fascinated with the night sky, and I wanted to learn more. My favorite treat was a trip to the Hayden Planetarium in New York, and I prevailed on my parents to get me a reflecting telescope. Instead of TV, I could be found in the backyard on a clear night, checking out the Pleiades, Jupiter, Mars, and the craters on the moon. My reflections on St. Francis recently reminded me, however, that my seven-year-old experience of absolute love had some lifelong learning lessons attached. Jesus warned his disciples, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. The NDE visions of pure love are the most innocent as doves revelations the heart welcomes in, especially as a child and it took the brain's capacity for shrewdness a while to catch up and then even subvert for a while the heart of the dove. My love of the night sky inspired me to expand my horizons, and with some spare lumber and some time after school, I started building a structure behind our one-car garage where the noise and lights of the house were minimized, and I could be alone with my telescope and my thoughts. My very minimal structure, which I called my fort, was soon knocked down by a gang of kids a few years older and bigger than me who lived on the next block. I patiently rebuilt it, only to find it wrecked once again. Then one day a few of the kids came into my yard saying they just wanted to be friends. One came up to me with his hand out, and when I offered my hand to him, he gut-punched me really hard in the stomach. I'd never been hit like that before. And the betrayal of it, oh, what a fool I'd been, was more shocking even than the nausea. They ran away in an instant, and I never saw them again. But the weight of their attack left a learning lesson on my brain as powerful as the learning lesson on my heart from my drowning NDE. Now I was afraid to go into my own backyard at night, afraid that they might come back, beat me up again, even destroy my telescope. Yet I still yearned for the night sky and my time alone with it. Finally, in a burst of inspiration, I took over an empty attic room and turned it into my own planetarium. I hit the local appliance store for refrigerator cartons to build a cardboard skyline around the edges of the room with Christmas lights wired to a transformer to create the changing sunsets and sunrise. A projector from the Hayden Planetarium gift shop provided the stars and I would write scripts for shows about supernovas and comets, meteor strikes, and the creation and end of the world. My mom was usually my only audience. She would come to the attic, patiently stretch out on a mattress on the floor, and humor my involvement with the stars. The snake and dove introduction to my life affected me in other ways as well. I used to be diligent in memorizing my catechism for Catholic Sunday school. Now my classmates were amused by the ruler wax by, to the back of my hand from the enormous nun who was regularly displeased with, by my failure to recite the catechism lessons for the week. The questions were interesting. Why did God make me? But the answers, God made me to show his goodness and to make me happy with him in heaven, were now seeming to me to be simple-minded. 
to my NDE way of thinking and hardly explained why I was here with the snakes and the nuns if he really wanted me there with him in heaven. But I didn't know where to go with this, and being a kid, I moved on. In retrospect, though, I think the first and greatest commandment gets shortchanged completely in our preoccupation with how to deal with each other. But the two are totally interrelated when you think about it. From Mark's gospel, the most important one answered Jesus is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It's been decades since my childhood NDE, and I still haven't yet lived up to this truth. And yet, this is clearly the ultimate answer and facilitator to part two, the loving your neighbor part of the equation. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength? Huh. Well, why are we so easily distracted from that? I believe it's because our snake brain divides us, divides up our understanding of our lives by labeling one thing after another. It keeps our dove heart from acknowledging it's all part of the one, and that one is built on love. Trapped in time, we have to deal with life sequentially. So sequentially, in fact, that we actually accomplish more when we form habits in our productivity. If we had to rethink how to brush our teeth and get dressed and to get to work every morning, we'd be exhausted by midday and have nothing left to tackle the new questions of the day. But if we could see the whole thing in the context, that spirit is present in all of it, because uh, both the routine and the creative uh, then we could embrace the, the oneness with the heart and soul and mind and strength Jesus was talking about. A practical benefit from this would be an immediate reduction in stress. Habitual routines and major problems all become part of the same thing, part of the whole. And so all our challenges get put in perspective. The example that comes to my mind is St. Francis' early repulsion and horror at the idea of coming in contact with lepers. But when, perhaps through his near-death experience, he learns to see God in all things, the oneness includes even leprosy as a reason for his being and his love. Likewise, if I'd been aware of all this back then, I could have seen that gut punch as a, as a part of the big picture as well. When Andy ears return from their experiences, they have a number of ways to describe the oneness they have seen. Some speak of it as light, the light radiating from the spirits of departed family, the light radiating from angels and guides, the light radiating from the beautiful plants and trees and streams of water. Others say the light is everywhere radiated, but coming from one source, illuminating the city of God, the buildings and the fields where children and animals play together. Others have seen larger panoramas with fields and forests stretching into mountains and all of it conscious and alive with light. And then there are those who see only light stretching endlessly in all directions, along with the knowledge that it goes to infinity yet never changes. They say you can travel that light forever, but wherever you pause, you're always home. And then there are those who encounter a particularly significant, intensely beautiful light, embodying one they name as Jesus or God or both. Some call this light 10,000 times brighter than the sun, a light that would blind them on earth, but there was nothing to fear in its presence. It's hard to imagine from here, and yet we may be able to understand it even better than they, and that's because if you pin them right down to their descriptions of light, they usually do admit that it is actually the manifestation of love. Now, if we have hearts open enough, we can recognize that love, as tangible as light, all around us here on earth, St. Francis got it in a bird, a friend, a leper, an old ruined church in need of fixing, a Vatican and Pope in need of fixing, a crusader's war in need of fixing. For him, the love of the love was visible, especially in nature, where I suspect he saw birds and trees and flowers here 
the way Endy ears see them on the other side. He saw them radiating consciousness and love, just as they do in paradise. How can that be? It's simply because all of this is one. Most brains don't allow us to see this reality because of the dangers that lurk in such openness. But when something temporarily disables the brain or an out-of-body experience occurs, the eyes of the soul can see that all things on earth reflect the oneness of it all. So is our brain our enemy when it comes to seeing the big picture? Perhaps, but we still need it for sure. The warning Jesus gave his disciples in Matthew 10, 16 is a warning to us as well. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. How is that possible? It's by acknowledging the different components in our makeup, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. And when they're working together, uh, we are as wise as snakes and as innocent as doves, and at one with God. Well, thanks for listening. If you'd like to hear this show again, or any of our more than 500 archived, ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button, or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone, for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying once again, thanks for listening.